It's Thursday, the 19th of December. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And today we're discussing the tragic accident of the Pilatus PC-12 aircraft in Chamberlain, South Dakota that occurred on 30 November and the preliminary NTSB report, which just recently came out. First, a little background on the Platus PC-12 aircraft. The PC-12 is a single-engine, low-wing, turboprop, pressurized aircraft who has a various seating configurations capable of carrying either six to nine passengers plus the two pilot seats in front for a total of 11 seats total on the whole airplane. Very popular design. Over 1,700 of these have been built. Pilatus, of course, is uh, from Switzerland, designed and built over there. They're single engine, high aspect ratio wing with a 1200 horsepower PT6A turboprop engine makes them very popular for short field operations. Some other characteristics of the PC-12 is it's a T-tail configuration. It has a high tail. Uh, for icing considerations, it does have de-icing boots, pneumatic boots, on the leading edge of the aircraft. For stall protection, it has a stall shaker, correction, a stick shaker, which will shake the stick violently, which will alert the pilot that he's approaching a stall when he's within five to 10, well, closer to five knots of a stall. If the pilot continues to slow the aircraft to exceed the critical angle of attack, at which point the aircraft is very close to stalling within less than five knots of stalling, a stick pusher will push the stick forward in an effort to prevent the stall from happening. This stick pusher in the PC-12 can be overridden with over 50 pounds of force by the pilot, or you can actually physically turn the, turn the uh, stick pusher system off. However, the stick pusher is required for flight. By the way, the stick pusher system on the PC-12 uses two computers and both computers on the PC-12 stick pusher system have to agree before the stick pusher is actuated. A little more about what we know of the flight prior to the uh, NTSB preliminary report. The flight departed out of Twin Falls, Idaho the day before, two hour flight to Chamberlain, South Dakota, landed uneventfully, picked up 150 gallons of fuel at the automatic uh, fuel pump there at Chamberlain. By the way, Chamberlain Airport is an uncontrolled airport, very common, just like here at uh, the <laughs> Blanco Lirio Global Headquarters Airport, Nevada County. The aircraft was then parked outside for the night. We don't even know if there was a hangar available for the aircraft for overnighting at Chamberlain. The family went to a hunting lodge and spent the evening there before coming back the next morning. Two members of the family came out and spent over three hours trying to get the snow and ice off of the aircraft before they departed. Overnight, Highway 90 was closed for icing conditions, severe icing and terrible driving conditions from Chamberlain all the way to the Wyoming border. Now I'll go over the NTSB preliminary re report from a pilot's perspective. Again, this is just a preliminary report. These are only the facts as they know them so far, the final investigation will take anywhere from 12 to 14 months. And since this accident involves weather and icing, that sort of evidence is fairly ephemeral. It doesn't stick around. Either the icing melts off by the time investigators get there or it is covered with additional snow and ice from weather that's occurred between the time of the crash and the time investigators arrive on the scene. The NTSB issued its preliminary report Tuesday, this is 17 December, for its investigation of the 30 November 2019 crash of the Pilatus PC-12 in Chamberlain, South Dakota, which killed the pilot, 
and eight passengers and injured three others. The airplane was registered to Conrad and Bischoff Incorporated and operated by the pilot as a personal flight from Chamberlain Municipal Airport destined for the Idaho Falls Regional Airport, Idaho. Personal flight, that means Part 91, FAR Part 91. That's the, the same FAR part that all, all of us general aviation pilots operate under. That's not to be confused with Part 135, which is charter air taxi operations, or Part 121, which governs airline operations. Each different FAR part has a completely different set of safety regulations associated with it. According to pre preliminary data recovered from the data recorder installed on the airplane, the accident takeoff began from runway 31, that means he's taken off to the north on a runway heading of 310 degrees, at about 12.31 p.m. Central Standard Time. The, air the airplane immediately rolled about 10 degrees to the left after takeoff. I mean, this is within seconds of takeoff. The roll decreased to about five degrees left as the airplane climbed through about 170 feet above ground level and then reversed to about five degrees right. The airplane ultimately entered a 64 degree left bank as the airplane reached its peak altitude of 460 feet above the ground. The cockpit stall warning and stick shaker became active about one second after liftoff and the stick pusher became active about 15 seconds after liftoff. They continued immediately, they continued intermittently for the duration of the flight. The data recording ended at 12.33 p.m. So that's only about three minutes. So it's obvious the aircraft stalled on takeoff. The big investigation is to be, to find out why did this aircraft stall so immediately after takeoff. No radio communications were received from the pilot and radar contact was never established. We can talk more about that here in a minute. The, recor the recorder also captured cockpit sound. I didn't know that about the PC-12, that the data recorder could record s sound as well. The NTSB will convene a group of technical experts to produce a transcript. Weather at the time was recorded as being overcast with clouds at 500 feet and a half mile visibility in moderate snow with wind from the direction of 20 degrees at six knots. The temperature and dew point were both one degree Celsius. Okay, when the temperature and dew point are within two degrees of each other, that means the moisture is darn near 100% and that also tends to lead to fog. The wind direction of 20 degrees at six knots is the correct, they're taking off into the wind, in other words. The altimeter setting was 29.30 inches of mercury. Freezing rain and snow were observed in the vicinity of the airport the previous afternoon and overnight before the accident flight, which was operated on an instrument flight rules flight plan, IFR flight plan. We talked extensively about the hazards of operating in conditions of freezing precipitation on the previous update. Witnesses reported that the pilot and passenger worked for three hours to remove the snow and ice from the airplane before the accident flight. The witnesses reported that visibility was limited by snow at the time of the accident. The accident site was located at 1.57 p.m., so that's nearly an hour and a half later, three-fourths of a mile west of the airport in a dominant cornfield, or dormant cornfield. The debris path was approximately 85 feet long, that's not very long, and was oriented on a 179 degree heading. So in other words, the debris path was 180 degrees from the direction that they departed. And then they go on to explain what the preliminary report means. It doesn't give a probable cause. They'll, that's what's going to take 12 to 14 months to figure out. So it's obvious from the report that the aircraft stalled on takeoff. It's going to be up to an accident investigator to determine why this aircraft stalled on takeoff. And of course, they're going to be looking at pilot experience, the loading of the aircraft, 
tragically, a lot of these passengers were young children and icing, the weather, the weather, it appears to me as if this accident may have very well been initiated the entire day before when the aircraft was parked outside in the elements. It's very hard to get snow and ice removed from an aluminum airframe, especially if it's been sticking on that airframe all night long without proper de-icing equipment. In the airline industry, we have a whole science and technology to de-icing aircraft and keeping the icing off of the aircraft. This aircraft apparently did not have any of that capability. I suspect the three hours that they spent trying to remove the ice off of this aircraft were with, was manually with brooms and that sort of thing. If you do not get all of the ice off of the aircraft, particularly off of all of the flying surfaces before you depart, you have exceeded the original design certificate limitations of that aircraft before you even break ground. The PC-12 is one aircraft I haven't flown before, but I want to share with you a couple of bits of information I've found from the manufacturer, Pilatus, and I'll post them in the links down below. Here's a service letter from Pilatus regarding the stick shaker and pusher system on board the aircraft. This is dated back to November of 1994. The stick shaker slash pusher system, SS slash P, of the PC-12 is a safety device. It has a function of warning the pilot of an impending stall, and when the pilot does not recognize or respond to other signs, e.g. airspeed AOA or aircraft pitch angle. Should the pilot ignore the stall warning, that's the stick shaker, that's, that's the warning, in the form of an oral warning accompanied by the stick shaker, and not initiate proper stall recovery procedures, then the stick pusher system would come into operation to prevent the aircraft from entering an aerodynamic stall. It literally pushes the stick forward. The design of the Pilatus PC-12 aircraft has a high aspect ratio wing, that's a long slender wing with a high horsepower, 1200 horsepower turboprop engine on it. In order to achieve its good low speed handling characteristics, it's got a very st slow stall speed. An angle of attack, a critical angle of attack, which allows the aircraft to achieve very slow speeds. It also has a high cruise speed capability as well. So when you put those two together and you look at the stall characteristics of the aircraft, it's got a rather peaky stall characteristic. In other words, the aircraft will continue to fly until you exceed the critical angle of attack, at which time the lift just drops off dramatically. And now, if you're doing a power on stall with that big old 1200 horsepower engine, single engine up front, the torque of that engine is going to roll you over to the left and it's going to roll you over rather abruptly. Here's a look at that lift curve with gear down and flaps 40. Once the angle of attack achieves about 15 degrees, the lift just drops off precipitously. And if you have icing on your wing, you're going to achieve the critical angle of attack at a much smaller angle. So it was because of these characteristics Pilatus developed the stick shaker and stick pusher system in this aircraft. These are systems that you don't typically find until you get into much larger, more complicated aircraft designs. And it is possible to override the stick pusher in the Pilatus. Like I said before, you can either just turn it off or if you pull back, if you resist the stick pusher with a force greater than 50 pounds, you can override the stick pusher. However, there is this warning. This is from the aerodynamicists and the head of flight test of Pilatus. It's possible to override the stall protection system by holding the control wheel back with sufficient force, approximately 50 pounds, or even to disconnect the system. In this case, the aircraft is obviously no longer protected against an aerodynamic stall. In other words, you're on your own. Depending on the power setting and flap configuration, severe, although not unrecoverable, roll departures can occur. That's again, you're going to feel the torque of that engine. It's going to roll you over assuming you've got full power. 
This is, of course, very dangerous in the initial and final flight phases, landing and takeoff close to the ground. Since even a very experienced pilot will not be able to recover from a critical aerodynamic stall departure without a severe altitude loss of up to 700 feet. So if you do a power on stall in a Pilatus PC-12, you're going to need about 700 feet to recover. This accident flight only achieved about 400 feet maximum altitude before stalling the aircraft. So again, investigators will be looking at pilot experience, recency of currency and training in the Pilatus PC-12, the loading of the aircraft, and of course the weather and the icing conditions at the time of the aircraft uh, accident. And it's going to be, that's always a challenge in these weather-related accidents because the, the evidence tends to disappear. This is a very tragic accident for the family involved. They lost over four generational members of that family from Twin Falls, Idaho. As we get more information, we'll keep you posted on this. Again, it's going to take 12 to 14 months before we get the final answer from the NTSB as to what happened in Chamberlain, South Dakota. See you here.